You know, sometimes it seems not a week goes by without some channel posting a best motorcycle helmet video. But here's the thing, I really believe that unless you've ridden in every single one of them, nobody can tell you which is the absolute best. And that's before we consider that your needs and head shape will very likely be different to those of the presenter, be they an influencer looking for the next big viewing figures, or a shop that might not stock every product, or indeed might have its own agenda on what it wants to see going out of the warehouse. If you're serious about wanting to find out what your next helmet should be, then keep watching, because we're gonna look at how to choose the right one for you, and we're gonna hear what 2,133 Bike Social community members think of the helmets they've ridden in for a total of, what I reckon to be, more than eight million miles. I've broken this video into chapters so you can skip past bits that you already know, though then you'll miss all the opportunities to enjoy my rugged good looks. And I need to point out that all of the helmets you see in this video have been tested by Bike Social. That means they've been ridden in on all roads, in all conditions, on a variety of bikes before we write an honest review on them. Because we're not trying to sell them and we don't have any sponsorship deals. We do have a massive range of exclusive discounts for Bike Social members, but these are completely separate. I kind of feel like I need to explain this. We get no kickbacks or anything, and you'll find things on there that have had bad reviews and good. We also have a newly launched storefront, but this again isn't linked to editorial. A separate company controls stock, and any profit from that is pumped straight into the discounts for our members. Ultimately, Bike Social is about providing the best value for Bennett's insurance customers and for our standalone members. We have this editorial channel as a way of raising awareness of our brand and to hopefully help build trust. I rarely make product review videos because they can't be updated over time like a written review, which is why you need to read the reviews on the site for the most up-to-date info. If something fails after the review is published, we do update it. Anyway, <laughs> that's why we do this stuff, so let's not faff about. First off, what type of helmet do you want? You've got a fair old choice, open face or piss pot, Jet, piss pot with a visor, flip front, full face, adventure, and motocross style. So an open face obviously doesn't give your face any protection, but they are great on slower rides or cruising through town. You need to wear goggles with these, even the this showy, and this LS2. <laughs> because once you get up to speed, the wind whips under the um, sun shields and makes your eyes water. I've got to say that this LS2 Bob is really comfy and while it's still 120 pound, it's a composite fiberglass shell and it's almost a third of the price of this beautifully made showy JO. It has some premium uh, touches and I really like this goggle retention strap, um, which has a magnetic closure. There's just some nice bits on that. So, a jet helmet has a large visor, which won't save you from the road, but in our review, this showy J Cruise 2 impressed with its wind and bug protection. These are popular with city commuters and hot climate tourers. Now this is a bit of a weird one. Retro styled full face without a visor. Well, they sometimes do have a visor, but this is a showy X0, and this is the AGV X101. I love them because they're airy and they protect your face and because they look cool. Uh, they tend to be noisy and you'll still need to buy a pair of goggles for them. Yep, even the showy again, but on the right bike, they look great. Then we have the flip front. Surely the ultimate helmet is, uh, combines the airy nature of an open face with the safety of a full face. Well, it could be but some people think they're not cool, while others question the safety of them, despite them passing the current test standards. So a flip front needs to be homologated to be as P, protective, which means it has a protective chin bar, jet or open face, so like that. Uh, and you'll find this on the strap usually. You also could see NP, which means it has a non-protective chin section that could be more likely to fall to bits in a crash. The J bit is important if you want to legally ride with the helmet open, as it means the chin bar uh, has been tested to stay up while you're going along. 
Now most flip fronts have a chin bar that sits at the top of the helmet when it opens like this. Depending on your bike, this can act as a bit of a sail and can start to strain your neck a bit. But unless you're riding a lot with it open, it's not really such an issue. But this Shark Evo 1-2 flips all the way to the back, which is potentially a better system. It is worth noting that for now, while Shark came up with this design, LS2 has bettered it with the Valiant 2. So let's stop for a minute and hear from Graham Mudd, a Bike Social member who has one. Oh yeah, I'm Graham, now a member of Bike Social Test Team. John's asked me to talk a bit about my favourite helmet at the moment, and it's uh, it's this, the LS2 Valiant 2. It's a modular helmet, so it's a homologated for both full face use, and there's an open face, which I really like. You know, today it's been really hot and sunny, so I've been wearing it open face. But a few weeks ago it's really cold. You know, it's just easy just to uh, put the chin bar down, it snaps straight to place with no effort. Um, the mechanism, just operated by a foot under the chin, which you push in, and it just all smooth all the way to the back and just clicks into place, and then just easily rotates back forwards and snaps in, no, no effort whatsoever. Um, the Shark has got a similar helmet, um, by problems like getting stuck at the back and stuck halfway up, whereas this is a smooth and easy all the way around, so um, it's a much better mechanism in my opinion. The vents are really good, you've got the chin vent, you've got the forehead vents, you've got the exhaust at the back. Um, the ventilation is really good, um, but I found that in winter and in cold, they've got a draft across your face, which made my eyes water a bit. So if you're going to use this, in hel um, this helmet in winter, you can indeed wear a balaclava just to keep your face warm. But um, for summer use, it's absolutely fantastic. A good flow of uh, air over your face, over my head and down the back of my neck. So uh, top marks of ventilation. Comfort, got a removable lining. Uh, it's really easy to remove, it's really easy to put back in. Um, a lot of helmets have problems getting the, uh, the lining back in, but this goes in really easily and it's so comfy. It's uh, plush, it doesn't give me hamster cheeks. And I've worn it on a couple of uh, all day rides, it's all day comfortable. Um, you know, it's been times where I'm glad to get to a petrol station on my petrol bike and uh, glad to get my helmet off. But, um, with this, comfortable all day long. Uh, the micrometric buckle, nice and easy to operate, which I really like. You know, double D rings, I've always found awkward, especially with gloves on. It just, just clicks in, tab to release. It's really simple, even with winter gloves on, it's really easy to use. And also, I really like the visor, it's really thick, really chunky. Um, I've tested the anti scratch and I dropped it on the floor, and uh, there's no problems. And it comes with um, a pin lock visor in the box, so there's uh, no worries about steaming up. And you got all the way open, but you've got the, um, the crack settings, you've got a little bit at the bottom. So if it does miss, if it did miss up, you've got a little crack at the bottom to help with uh, ventilation. And it snaps shut, clicks, and there's no leaks from the visor. So it's a really good uh, visor system. But the bit I like the most is the release mechanism. So simple, you just pull this catch, it rotates forwards, the visor comes out, and then the visor literally just clicks back in. Why can't more visor systems be like that? No screws or bits that lock together. It literally just click in, click out. It takes seconds, it's really simple. So the LS2, it's just a great, comfortable, all-round modular helmet. It's an absolute bargain at 250 quid. Um, the Shark doesn't perform as well, and it's 100 pounds more. So the LS2 Volume 2, absolute bargain. It gets my rec recommendation for my helmet. Now flip fronts or modular or system helmets tend to be a bit heavier and a bit noisier than a good quality full face thanks to the gaps at the sides which can kind of cause some turbulence to let wind noise in but there are a lot of variables so we'll look at noise later. Besides being able to give you loads of air in hot rides, flips are great because you can just open them up to talk to people and you don't have to take them off when you fill up with fuel. Now, that's not been a problem since Covid but it might become an issue again later. So full face lids, the most popular helmet, these should offer the best possible protection and have the lightest weight and sportiest styling. Chances are this will be the first style most people think of. Now here's another bike social member, Patricia Steinke with her AGV K6. Hi, Patricia here. Um, I've been asked today to talk about why this is my favorite helmet. Uh, this is the AGV K6. 
and um, it is the most expensive helmet I have owned so far, but it's also the best I've had so far. Um, it's uh, it's fairly lightweight. It is quiet helmet, although obviously um, earplugs is is absolutely necessary over 40 miles an hour. Uh, it's, it's a good sturdy helmet. There's nothing flimsy or plasticky feeling about this. Yeah, so that's the other thing I like about it is you feel like you've got a piece of quality in your hand. Um, the ventilation is quite the ventilation is quite good. It's got two vents in the it's got two vents in the front. These are open. These I keep open all year round because the air intake is not so massive that uh, uh, that it's a problem even on the coldest days in winter. Uh, they're easy to close though um, with just this. They're easy to operate with gloves on. Uh, it's got three more vents up here. One in the middle. One on two on the sides. Um, these stay closed all winter. Um, in the summer, you definitely feel the difference with them open, and it's quite good. The only thing about these mechanisms is that if you don't keep them, if you don't keep them clean, they start becoming a bit difficult to operate with gloves on. Uh, the only two always open vents are the ones at the back of this lip, which is fine. I mean, it it does the job. Um, the other thing that contributes to this helmet being rather quiet and keeping the wind out is this nice little chin curtain, uh, which can be taken out for those that uh, don't like quite quite so much around the neck. Uh, it's got the emergency pull tabs for in case in case uh, there is an accident and emergency workers need to remove these neck neck rings in order to get your helmet off a bit easier. Uh, it's got a double D ring fastening. Uh, which is quite sturdy, quite solid. Um, it is really easy. It's really easy to undo with your, even with gloved hands on. It's impossible to do up with gloved hands, um, but I think that's a feature of all D rings. Um, yes, uh, the visor easy to open, easy to open up and close. It's got uh, it's, it's got a little catch here, and so you can lock it. You can lock it into a cracked open position, so that's good. And then with a little click, it's uh, it's once this gets this does need a little bit of oiling, which I haven't done in a while, but um, it can it, it opens up easily and springs back up. It comes with a pin lock 120, which does its job quite nicely in keep in keeping the keeping it from fogging up on the inside during rain and other damp conditions. The visor is easy enough to is easy enough to remove. Just a little ratchet in the open position, pop out and pull again and pop back in. That's it. The only niggle I do have is the fact that it doesn't have a very wide flat area to attach either intercom or camera mounts to. You can see that my Senna sits quite high up, hasn't flown off yet, so hey, it's all good. Um, other side, same thing, there's a camera mount, and once again, the camera has actually stayed in situ at uh, somewhat higher speeds. Let's not talk about that. Um, anyway, the nose guard is quite, it's also very, it's, it's flexible. I have, it has not touched my nose so far, so um, well fitted. Um, and it won't pop out easily, which is nice. And it's 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 nice. It's soft. It's not really. It's not hard plastic, which is which is also quite good. It's warm in the winter. That's what I appreciate. That's one of the things I really appreciate about it, because it's got a very plush interior, and it really um, you, you, it feels really good to just have it next to your skin. Um, so. Yeah, so that's good. It's I have worn it now for about twenty thousand miles, and that's a lot of that's been through the winter, and it's taken a bit of a battering, but it still looks in pretty good condition. Um, and um, yeah, it hasn't let it, it hasn't let me down in terms of I haven't had to I haven't had to cuss about it at all. Um, you can wear it on track days because it's got the British motorcycle sport golden sticker on the back. I mean, I have a uh, I have an HTC RPHA 11, which I 
tend to take in for track days and in the summer because it's got so many events the definite open events that are definitely not not a winter helmet um it's also a bit noisier <laughs> but um i can take this one on cold track days as well so it's all good and if the color scheme isn't quite to your liking well um a bit of um vinyl wrap samples for a few quid and a talented daughter who can paint and you can make it your own so i think i can recommend this with good conscience and as i said so far it's my favorite helmet for me the new Arrow Quantic stands out as a superb full face helmet, but it does start at 500 pounds. Now, let's look at adventure style helmets. The most obvious thing is that they tend to have a, a peak on them, which you can usually remove. That keeps mud away from your face when the bike in front is spraying it up from its rear wheel. Or for most real world riding, it does a brilliant job of shielding your eyes from low sun. Now most of these lids will also let you take the visor off and use goggles if you want, which is more useful off-road and they should have particularly good ventilation. Now this one's got feeding straight through into the mouth as well as up over the inside of the visor. Some are better than others when it comes to how much drag this uh, peak can cause and in some cases they'll shake at speed and actually these two are two that I found particularly good. This Shoei Hornet ADV and Arrow 2X4 are both really popular lids that I've used. Personally, I'd say that the Shoei is more road focused thanks to the easier to remove visor, whereas the Arrow offers more to those who do venture off road as it's easier to use with goggles and the ventilation is more powerful. And despite me not being an off road rider, it's actually the Arrow I prefer, but like all the helmets you see here, the full reviews will help you decide if they're the right ones for you. And remember that there are many, many more on the site too for you to check out. And finally, we have motocross or MX style lids. This one probably looks a bit small because frankly, I'm rubbish off-road and my mates and I all use adventure style lids or open faces on green lanes. So this is my 12 year old daughters. A motocross lid will have a roost blocking peak and should have great ventilation, but it won't have a visor. So you do need goggles. Okay, so by now you should know what type of helmet you want and I've told you what we liked, but everyone's different, so how do you narrow your choices down? I asked our Bike Social community members to fill in a helmet survey and got 2,133 completed forms. I can't stress enough how great that is for our first survey. And over the years, these are gonna grow and grow. This is just the beginning of the biggest annual motorcycle consumer report, so hit subscribe if you wanna see more. Of the people I spoke to, 61% of them have been riding for more than 20 years, and only 2% for less than a year. But those opinions are every bit as important. 58% of them owned one bike or scooter. A quarter had two, and that left 17% with three or more. A lucky 5% owned five or more bikes or scooters. So 46% of the respondents said they cover between 1,000 and 3,000 miles a year, though that might be a bit lower due to lockdown. And 34% say they do between 4,000 and 6,000 miles. 13% are putting more than 7,000 miles on their bikes every year. So we've got a good spread of people covering plenty of miles in their helmets. 42% of those surveyed currently own two helmets. 23% own just one, but 20% own three. The rest own four or more. We asked people to mainly talk about the helmet they ride in most. And 10 helmet brands stood out as having the largest data sets in, these, in this survey. And because the data sets get smaller below that, the results tend to get a little bit shaky. So we're gonna focus on those top 10 in this. Uh, as the years go by, you know, as time goes by and we get to make more of these and we do more surveys and our, our base grows, obviously the, the number of helmets we cover should grow because we're getting even more feedback on them. So, based on those 2,133 people, these are what they ride in most. Shoei, Arai, Shark, HJC, AGV, Schuberth, Kberg, Bell, Nolan, LS2, and other. You can see from this graph that Shoei really was the most ridden in helmet by a long stretch. Other accounted for 9% with brands including Rurock, Leopard, Harley Davidson, BMW, Jivy, and I can't remember making up some of these. I asked all 2,133 people to rate the importance of the things that matter to them when buying a helmet, and safety was number one. So let's look at that first. 
All lids legally sold in the UK now conform to ECE 2205. This is just a minimum standard and some are safer than others. You can get more detail on some helmets at the Sharp website, but this is getting a little bit outdated now with very few new lids appearing. That's not helped I'm sure by COVID and it's also a government funded scheme that buys all the lids it tests. But from 2024, all helmets sold will have to comply with the much tougher ECE 2206 standard. For now, there's very little choice. In fact, the Arrow Quantic is the only helmet you can currently buy that's tested to 2206, with the Shoei NXR2 being the only other that I know for certain is due by the end of the year. Now, having a clean, round-shaped shell is part of what makes a helmet safer, thanks to how it glances off in an impact. And it's something Arrow has stuck to over many years. It's been called outdated for it, but being the first to release a 2206 compliant lid maybe vindicates them to some extent. On this one, the bits that do stick out are designed to shear off in a crash. And over time, it's likely we'll see other brands doing this or just making helmets with fewer protrusions. Now, the word from a few brands is that there will be some helmet models that are gonna disappear from shelves over time as they just won't meet the tougher standard. We're gonna to have to wait and see, but it certainly won't mean the end of affordable helmets. I've already requested the range of entry level offerings from LS2 as soon as they've met 2206. And of course, we'll be covering the full range of helmets as they, as, as they hit the market. So expect reviews of them soon and keep checking out Bike Social for them. What helmets made of will affect people's perception of safety, but there are currently plenty available that typically either use a plastic outer shell or a composite fiber or pure carbon fiber. Carbon fiber one there. Some people reckon a soft outer shell like polycarbonate with a harder inner polystyrene liner is the best bet. While the more costly helmets tend to have a hard outer with a softer inside, like an armadillo. Armadillo! Personally, and this is just my opinion, I prefer it to be a hard outer shell as it makes sense to me to be able to spread any impact over a larger surface area before it's transferred inside. It also means you tend to have a more comfortable interior because it can conform to your head shape more easily. In our survey, Arrow was considered the safest helmet brand with an average score of 9.1 out of 10, closely followed by Shoei at 9.0. Ultimately though, safety can only be promised with proper testing, not by promises from a manufacturer or what a helmet looks or feels like. EC2206 is gonna make it much clearer. If you wanna know more about this, hit the video up here, up top, though I'll link it to the end too, so you don't get distracted now. Overall, the second most important thing when buying a helmet, according to our survey, is comfort. And basically, if you don't have a helmet that fits properly, it won't be as safe. Any helmet should fit snugly around every part of your head. You shouldn't have squashed in cheeks, but you do need to make sure it can't twist from side to side or rotate back and forth. That's with the strap secure but not choking you. And whether you're spending 50 pound or 500 pound or even more, take your time when trying a helmet on as any pressure points can feel a little annoying in the shop, but even after half an hour in the saddle, they can become agony. I once had a very cheap Duccini that felt like someone was rubbing a knife across my head after a very short time. So getting one that suits your head shape is really important. Somebody else could have worn that helmet and found it fine, but for my head shape, that became unwearable. You will likely find that more premium brands with a softer liner are more comfortable because they are more compliant to your head shape, but don't assume that anything will fit you. In my case, Arrow and Shoei both do always fit me, while Shubath can be a bit hit and miss. MT seems to come up a little small, but are otherwise fine, and only about half the shark range suits me. Bells seem to fit me, but watch with any helmet if you wear glasses. Even some that say they're designed for specs can leave them hovering over your nose or the arms digging into your head. The Bike Social community declared Arai the winner for comfort with an average of 8.9 out of 10. Shoei, again, was very close behind with 8.7, but of the 10 most popular helmet brands in the survey, they all did pretty well, with Kberg having the lowest score of a still good 8.0. It does show that most people are trying helmets on before they buy them and they're you know and they're staying happy with them which is great build quality was next and this is something that to some extent you can you can get a feel for when you pick a lid up how well is a trim finished what's the lining like does it creak when you flex it and what's the plastic like on the vents you tend to get what you pay for and it's going to be no surprise to most that Shoei and Arai were voted best for build quality with average scores of 9.1 out of 10. Shubath came next 8.9, the lowest score among the 10 most popular helmets in our survey being from Kberg again, though this was still a healthy 8.0. 
Fogging was the next most important consideration among the bike social community members who responded, and of them, showy owners had the least problems with it, giving their helmets an average of 8.0 out of 10. Ventilation plays a key role in fogging. The chin vent will typically blow up across the inside of the visor, and you also want an effective exhaust to draw the moist air out. Only the cheapest lids save costs by not including the pinlock anti-fog insert, although some more expensive ones might use a visor that's got an anti-fog coating. Personally, I'm not as keen on that. Anyway, pin locks, I would say, are worth having as they create a double glaze that massively reduces fogging in bad weather. If you breathe heavily and seal everything up, they still will fail in the end, but they do do a good job. Max vision means they're bigger, so less likely to be seen in your peripheral vision, while the higher the number, the more effective they are. You can get a 30, 70, or 120 pin lock. Some budget lids, like this MT, have pins for a pin lock, but one still isn't included, so keep in mind that if you ride in colder weather, it might be worth budgeting the extra 15 quid or more, depending on the helmet. If you're having trouble with fogging, even with a pin lock, check you're getting some air moving, but also look at adjusting the pins which are on a cam. Rotate them and it can help the seal sit tight against the visor all the way around. If there's a gap, it won't work. If you're not happy doing this, take it back to the shop, as any decent one will support you. Noise was next in the survey, but this is a tricky one. Somehow it's a test in a wind tunnel, but always on an unfaired bike. The trouble is that the fairing is what causes the most noise as it disrupts the airflow. So what one rider considers a quiet helmet on their bike might seem noisy to someone else. Wind roar is one problem, then you've got buffeting noise too. Trouble is, you won't know until you ride in it. Honestly, of all the helmets I've used over 25 years, I've never had one that was so noisy I couldn't wear it. You must wear earplugs. Uh, anything over 40 mile an hour, the wind noise gets so much. And trust me, tinnitus is rubbish and I don't even have it that bad. Personally, I prefer disposable ear soft earplugs like these, or these earpiece filter plugs, which cost about 20 quid and make it easier to hear music over the intercom. Earplugs reduce the wind noise, not the sound of sirens, car horns, screaming pedestrians or skidding tires. And your engine exhaust sound better too, so I'm not buying those arguments against them. In the community survey of more than 2,000 riders, Shoeberth came out on top for noise with an average score of 7.9 out of 10. The sixth most important thing among bike social community respondents when buying a helmet was ventilation. I'd actually put this right after build quality myself as it affects your comfort in the heat and any fogging, though that's also because I wear glasses. And no matter how good the pin lock in your lid, these still missed up. And anti-fold coatings that can be used on a visor, they tend to make the anti-reflective coating on your specs go all streaky. Look for easy to use vents on the outside of the helmet. But particularly on cheaper ones, try to take a look inside too, as they don't always actually go anywhere. And lots of channels deep in the polystyrene aren't necessarily to help air move. These are actually a way that some manufacturers make hard polystyrene appear softer by taking some of it away. The air will move around inside a decent skull cap, so look for plenty of entry and exit points. You still need to read reviews though, as some will work better than others, and some will create air hotspots that can make it annoying having wind blast on one point on your head. The fairing and screen on your bike, again, will affect how much air can get to a lid, but you want something that can let air move all over your head, but will also give the option to close it off in winter. The best full face lid I've used so far is the Arrow Quantic, and the Bike Social Community Survey also reckoned that Allies gave the best ventilation. The top of the range RX-7 is well known for its powerful venting too. Effective ventilation is also another reason to wear earplugs. I've had large flies get in through some vents before, this helmet included, and it is a horrible feeling to have anything crawling around near your open ear canal at 70 mile an hour while it's trapped inside a lid. The seventh most important thing to the survey respondents was value, and this has to be an incredibly personal thing. LS2 was voted best with a score of 8.4 out of 10, while Shark, AGV, Kberg, Bell and Nolan followed with 8.2, then HJC with 8.1. What's good value to one person might be out of reach to another, so let's stop to hear from another bike social member, John Mansfield. I'm John and I uh, work in Barton Clay as a bike instructor. This leopard helmet that I've bought, I've had several of these over the years. I tend to buy them uh, because they are extremely cheap. And given the fact that I sort of get through probably one a year, it kind of, you know, it's, it kind of makes sense to me anyway to get something cheap. Anyway, I've since got hold of this one here, um, which comes in at £80. And um, for the price difference, uh, the fact the cheap, though, as a cheap helmet, it's, it's many, many times as good as this one is. This is okay, but it's really plasticky. Um, it's quite noisy and quite creaky and everything. 
So if we're talking about people who, I don't know, just want to do their CBT, go to work on a, on a cheap bike or go to the station or go and deliver McDonald's or what have you, who, you know, the thought of spending a month's rent on a crash helmet would be utterly ridiculous, then I would certainly suggest spending the extra £40 just on this one, purely because it's way, way better quality. Um, even things like the, the little apertures, if you want to put sort of music in there and what have you, it's much, much better. Um, it's also good for glasses, the, um, the visor's better, it's quieter, it's more comfortable. The sun visor operates much cleaner. So if you really are after a really cheap helmet, just to get to work or the station or whatever, I really, I mean, these are, these are okay for the money, but I really would you know, spend the extra £40 and go for something like that, really, to be honest. You know, it's way, way better, way better. In fact, to something sort of four or five hundred pounds worth, which I've got, which is all right for sort of, you know, out riding when you just saw in your own time and what have you. Um, but this, the differences between that and an expensive one is enormous. The difference between this and a three, four hundred pound one is much narrower, way narrower. But I think it's great, this is. This is the, the expensive one which is many hundreds of pounds. Um, but, you know, it, it really is as good as open face uh, flip-up helmets get, I'd imagine, you know. It's right up there with the shoe butts and the shoeys and all the rest of it. It's easily up there. It's all quilted out like a, you know, like the lining on a Bentley, really, you know. It's all, it's all very plush inside. It's really quiet. It's well ventilated. It's just a great helmet, really, for everything. But the problem is, with, if I'm using it for work, um, 12, 18 months, it would be knackered and have to be buying another one. That's why for work, I just buy the cheap ones. But now I've had the 80 pound one, I won't get any more of the 40 pound ones. Because despite being pro despite being twice the money, it's way more than twice as good, way more. Well, I tend, to tell, I tend to tell students really the most important thing about when they go and choose a helmet, because you get people, you might have somebody sat with you who wants to pass their test, go and get a super bike, sat next to somebody who wants to go to the station and back on their moped. So it really is horses for courses. But um, I think, you know, spend as much as you can afford on a helmet, but the, the, the utmost important thing is the fit. If you get them off the internet, and whatever, you don't get a chance to go and try it on in the, in the initial instance. If you go to a, a reputable stockist, try loads of different ones on it. It's the fit that's most important, but it has to be comfortable and it has to fit you correctly, you know. Now check out this video where I look at what's inside a premium and a budget helmet. You can find that at the end too, and keep in mind that we'll probably see some discounts for helmets that don't meet 2206 over the coming years. So if budget's tight, that might be something to consider. Now what we've found out before about value was looking at whether people considered their own helmets good value. I also asked in the survey for up to three choices of brands most considered to represent the best value for money, be they the person's own helmet or other ones that they, they think of. And as you can see, HJC was voted top here at 24%, followed by AGV at 21%. Going deeper are the brands people ride in most. LS2 Kberg, followed by HJC, stood out as being the most considered value for money by the people who already owned them. On the other hand, look at how Schubert owners seem the least likely to suggest that their lids are good value. While the survey focuses on brands rather than specific models, in the comments one owner of a Shuba E1 was very disappointed with their lid, though another C3 Pro owner was delighted. And another said, I also own a full face Shuba. It's like buying a Volvo. They look shite, but in a smash it's the one you want around you. Styling is personal, but it's an interesting opinion. Weight is something that seems to be banded about when it suits manufacturers or when people are picking up lids in a store. I'll say now that wind drag is what causes me neck strain, not a heavy lid. Pick up a full carbon fibre lid like this Scorpion and hold an arrow in your other hand and they can feel very different, but on the road, I wouldn't say it matters at all. Interestingly, despite arrow having this reputation of being heavy with some people, actual owners don't really think so. Bike Social community members voted showy the best with an average score of 8.2, but arrow was nipping its heels with 8.1. Shape came next in importance, and while it'll be interesting to see how EC2206 affects this, this again is pretty personal. Our survey showed that Shoei and Aoi owners were the most impressed with their lids, though none of the brands in the 10 most popular of the survey got low scores. I think it's fascinating that a drop-down sunshield was considered so less important than everything else. Though as no Aoi's have them, that's going to have had some influence in this survey. Still though, as a brand that tends to have a good split of helmets with and without a sun visor, 58% of showy owners who responded had bought a helmet that did have one, while 42% hadn't. 
Only a quarter of our respondents bother with a separate dark visor, and unsurprisingly, the most likely to have one are ally owners. A quarter of our Shari owners are likely to have a dark visor, while 35% of our Bell owners say they do. Shoe birth owners gave the most importance to having a drop down sunshield, but in our survey at least, that sunshield isn't as important as you might expect. Of those that did have a sunshield though, Shoebirth and Shari owners rated theirs as the best, with an average score of 8.5 out of 10. Now when trying on a helmet, make sure you can easily operate the shield and also check that it stays up by, by nodding your head back and forth. Sadly though, this might not be something you discover is a problem until after a few thousand miles of use. In the shop though, check that there's no distinct colour cast and also try to find one that doesn't hit your nose but that leaves as small a gap as possible between the bottom of the shield and the visor aperture. Any light leaking in here can get quite distracting. Also see if you can try it while sitting on your bike to be sure the bottom edge doesn't cut annoyingly through your mirrors or your dash. Finally, the least important choice our bike social community respondents made when buying a helmet was graphics, but they reckoned our eye was the best with an average of 8.4 out of 10. This is one of my favorite graphics. Again, this is so very personal, but there can also be a way to get something a bit cheaper if you don't mind last season's designs. So how much should you spend on a helmet? Well, that depends how much you can afford. And while the cliche is to ask how much your head is worth, the most important thing is that comfort and fit. So try as many as you can afford on within your budget and a little above that if you can. Then narrow it down to the ones that fit best. Then look at the other factors like build quality, which you'll feel as you handle them to some extent. Look at the construction of the ventilation. And if there's any available, I'd opt for a helmet that's approved to DT2306. Of our bike social community respondents, the most popular price range was between 251 and 400 pounds, with 37% of them paying that much for the lid they ride in most. 23% paid between 151 and 250 pounds. Now of those riding most in our eyes, 5% of them spent over 601 pound against 3% in showies. But even then, it was the majority of 51% of our owners that bought something in that 251 to 400 pound price bracket. Remember, there are often deals to be had and whatever you choose, do also check for special discounts for Bike Social members. The largest proportion of HJC buyers fell into the 151 to 200 pound bracket, which was also the case for AGV, Kberg, Bell and LS2. It was the sheer number of showies, which were most likely to cost between 251 and 400 pounds, that put the average spend up. In helmets costing under 100 pound, LS2 was the most commonly worn of our top 10, while Kberg was more dominant than the others in the 101 to 150 pound price range. If money were no object, 31% of our respondents told us that they would buy a showy, followed by 23% who'd buy an ally. But there are some interesting standouts when you go deeper into that data. Like those whose main lid is an ally being the most likely to choose an ally again, while Kberg, Nolan and LS2 users were the most likely to choose a different brand. And you might wonder if you can save some money buying used, but you really shouldn't buy a secondhand helmet as you don't know how it's been stored or looked after. And it will have conformed to some extent to the previous user's head shape. Now that storage thing comes into how long you can keep a lid to. Most manufacturers will say five years from the date of purchase, sometimes seven years from the date of manufacture. The thing is, the polystyrene liner can degrade over time, especially if it's stored under hot conditions. And the outer shell could degrade too. Not to mention strap fastening is corroding on some helmets. But it's really hard to say. Common sense has to come into it. And someone like John, who we met earlier, can wear out a cheap helmet in a year. Think about it this way, if 251 to 400 pound is the most popular price range, even at 400 pound, that's 22p a day over five years. Now one question I forgot to ask in the survey was what fastens people prefer? A double D ring is generally considered the safest option as every time you put it on, it's set to be at the right tightness. It's also the only option our eye gives on all its lids and what you'll find on most sports style helmets. But that attitude is really a throwback to the belt buckle fasteners of old, which needed setting and then just clipped open and closed. The new micrometric straps are a different thing altogether. As you set them to suit you, then there's a good range of ratchet to ensure they're tight every time you put them on. 
and more premium ones are all metal, but ECE and Sharp Testing has shown them to be safe and effective. The real bonus with these straps is that you can use them even with winter gloves on, just do make sure you adjust them properly when you first get the lid. And then there's Voz, which doesn't use a strap at all thanks to this unique design. It's not a flip front as it has to be shut to ride in and it's not for everyone, but it does have the benefit of being very easy and safe to remove by emergency responders if they need to get it off without stemming the neck. Unfortunately, there's still no pin lock option for it and it's not easily compatible with intercoms. I found it comfortable, though the tight fit to the chin makes it difficult to yawn, something you don't really think about until you try to do it. Ultimately, it's an interesting helmet, but the biggest concerns I've seen raised by people is whether it could open up in a crash. Well done. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> we all stayed together fine. I guess I won't be wearing that anymore then. But you can read the full, honest and independent review of that, loads more helmets and a huge range of other riding kit on Bike Social. I did ask the community about intercoms and 34% of people said they had one fitted to the helmet they ride in most. While a lot of brands are now marketing their own systems, 28% of respondents say they used aftermarket devices, which is four times more than those who use a helmet's brand's own. Now watch out on some lids like this Neotech 2, as they can be hard to find space to fit anything but the manufacturer's own unit. Those riding in shoe bus were most likely of the top 10 brands to use the manufacturer's own system, followed by Shoei, which is almost certainly due to the close integration those companies have with Senna. Now, while some of the brands do have their own systems, only 6% of our Shark and Nolan owners use them, and 5% of KBuck. LS2's own system, also by Senna, accounted for 11% of the intercoms fitted by these owners. Now, 31% of aftermarket intercom users in our survey have a Senna, followed by 25% with Cardo and 15% with Interphone. 22% describe theirs as being unbranded, Amazon or other, with Freedcon proving popular among those, getting generally favorable comments. The thing is, even before we consider that this 31% doesn't take into account the helmet brand's own systems, most of which are made by Senna, it's clear who the market leader is among our respondents. If you're buying an intercom to talk to other riders, it's worth checking what your mates have, as compatibility between brands can be tricky at best and non-existent in the case of many mesh systems. The trouble is, each brand has its own good and bad points, so do check the constantly updated reviews of tech on Bike Social. Personally, I prefer using a Cardo most, but only by a small margin, though Senna has the better range and compatibility. I use mine to listen to music, get directions, talk to my wife when she's pillion. Most intercom owners I spoke to use them to listen to sat-nav directions at 56%, while music and talking to other riders are joint second most popular use at 41%. 32% use them to talk to a pillion, 18% listen to the radio on them, and just 1% use them for shooting video. Though there aren't many options for that, the Senna 10C Pro being one of the most popular, and one I've used, it is, it is very good. The radio thing is interesting, as in my experience, no intercoms are particularly good for this, even with RDS FM systems trying to keep them in tune. I've yet to find one that gives me a consistently good reception over a ride of more than about 20 miles. 29% of intercom users in our survey rated them eight out of 10, and Senna owners rated their intercoms an average of 8.0 out of 10, while Cardo scored 7.8 and Interphone 7.7. Those with the helmet brand's own intercom system rated them an average of 7.4 out of 10, which is interesting given that most of these are made by Senna. Unbranded Amazon and eBay intercom scored an average of 6.5, while those listed as other got 7.2. Common complaints among those who were unhappy with their intercoms was that they found them fiddly, suffered dropouts, or didn't think they were loud enough. 
Small buttons is likely what dragged down the score for some of those helmet branded systems. I would say that Senna often has a setting in the app that restricts the volume. So do go and find that and turn it off as soon as you get yours. Also, it might sound counterintuitive, but wearing earplugs, especially filtered ones, which are about 20 quid, make it a lot easier to hear any intercom. So what is the best helmet for you? When I asked the bike social community which three brands of helmet they considered the most associated with overall quality, 59% of respondents said Arai, followed by 57% saying Shoei. Delving deeper into that data for a final time, it's interesting to see how those who ride most in an Arai are also the most likely to say their own helmet represents the best brand for overall quality. After that, they're most likely to suggest the Shoei. Among the 10 helmet brands most likely to be worn by our respondents, those wearing Nolans were the least likely to say their helmet was among the best out there. I know there's a lot to take in, and if you've skipped to the end, you're probably wondering why I'm not holding up one lid, proudly proclaiming it to be the best you can buy. But most of you will now hopefully have a good grip on all the variables that need to be taken into account to decide what's the best helmet for you. And armed with that knowledge, and some of the helmets we've uh, suggested and shown you here, you'll be making a much better choice when you spend your money. So a huge thanks to every Bike Social member who completed this survey and to you for watching. And congratulations to Book and Schreiner who won the 250 pound prize draw. Keep a lookout for more of these videos covering not just riding kit, but a lot more that matters in biking too as we really work to grow this community. Whenever I post anything about a flip front lid on our Facebook page, I can guarantee there'll be several people slagging them off for not looking cool enough. If you haven't tried one, you won't know just how good they can be. And with the new ECE 2206 tests coming out, you can be even more confident of their safety. They really were popular in our survey with the Shoei Neotech 2 getting a lot of hits, but it was a comment from Gordon Hook of Shropshire who uses a Jivy X08 modular as his main helmet that really struck me as summing up how we all have such different needs. Both myself and my wife Andrea have the same Jivy helmet. We both feel the build quality is good and my wife is deaf, so the flip front means she can lip read when we stop without taking my helmet off.